We were talking a little bit about people, process, and systems, and you were talking about some interesting uh, you know, work that you had seen done over at CA Technologies about kind of the different skill sets required to build a pricing organization. Um, I, and I, th I think you're mentioning uh, Wendy, Wendy Johnson. Yeah. And, yeah, yeah. Yeah, Wendy, I met her actually at CA Technologies back in 2013. Uh, I was I was giving a 10 week course at to to their staff. There were like 10 people in the room, maybe 15, on pricing. What does pricing do? CA Technologies decided they want to take it more seriously. Well, that was back in, like I said, 2013. Time has changed. She left CA Technologies. She's now with a new company, and she is no longer the pricing analyst or manager. She's the director. She's the head honcho of pricing there. And it was, one, very satisfying to see one of my students move on. <laughs> but it was, it was interesting listening to her talk about pricing uh, within the organization and how she's building her team. Uh, so Wendy, I wish I knew her name, her company's name off the top of my bat. I'm sorry. But uh, in her pricing and her concept of a pricing team, she described the role you're trying to fulfill. And she had four kinds of characteristics, at least four in the kinds of roles that she saw. Uh, the pricing visionary, the person who's actually in charge of the overall pricing organization and interacting with the rest of the organization and communicating and driving pricing initiatives. The pricing uh, person who sets the price itself of different things and defines the price structures and goes about the research to define those prices, whether it be econometrics or primary market research or economic value to the customer, but that's the pricing people who would actually set the structure and the price points. And then she had the price management or the data management people who need to you know, manage all the statistical analysis for the transactions that are happening to forecast where prices should be landing, to understand um, the to do all the data analytics that price FX enables you to do, somebody needs to actually do it and own it and understand what this graph means and whether it's meaningful or meaningless, right? right. That becomes another group. And then the fourth role she described was deal desk. And there's been a lot of movement to try to get rid of deal desk. You know, we don't need to have custom made do this. We can use. CPQ by price FX and just get that done. And that is 99% true, maybe less, maybe more. There's still some certain deals that are just too strange. And it's not a put it all together type stuff. It's now involves also financing plans and working with other departments. It's it requires manual work. And so there's still a role for the deal desk. And so I like those four roles, the visionary, the price, pricing person themselves, the data management of pricing, and then actually deal desk, get it done, you know, execution. I right. thought that was a nice way to describe the roles. Indeed. And in doing so, she was also pointing out how different the people are. I mean, if you're great at doing data analytics on pricing, that doesn't mean you're great at running a market research program. All right. Absolutely. Yeah, I, th I think uh, new product pricing and and like the analytics and kind of, um, you know, optimization around pricing for existing products in a more mature business are very different. I, th I think you you do b work in both of those areas, though, um, right, in both uh, kind of Conjoin and, and Van Vestendorp and helping out like companies figure out what to price something that's new, um, but, but also, you know, helping them analyze their, their existing data. So I guess you see both sides of that. And, and, uh, so what, what would you say to, how, how would you say those things differ? Like what, like, can you, can you describe for the folks that maybe aren't, aren't as familiar with, with some of those concepts? Um, maybe they're familiar with one, but not the other. So can you just maybe c compare and contrast the, the approaches there a little bit? So when you're doing data management of pricing, it's really heavy statistics heavy statistics oriented things. You're trying to find correlations. Correlations between what? Well, you have to identify what it is you want to find those correlations to. So you're really stuck deep down in the math 
running hypotheses, testing out correlations, trying to understand what is meaningful. And just because A is correlated to B doesn't mean that A causes B. You know, it could just be a fluke. I mean, height and gender seem to be correlated. So, yeah. Uh, yeah. So uh, I think, you you know, uh, <clears throat> Steve Haggett, probably. Right, Steve. Yeah. Yeah. I love Steve. He spoke at one of our conferences about he showed, um, you know, the, the correlation between shark attacks and ice cream consumption, <laughs> which is pretty interesting. You know, and he's like, if you dr- were just to look at this and you were to draw causality from it, you might say that eating ice cream caused you get attacked by sharks. But in reality, both, you know, both happen more in the summertime when people are out in the water and eating a lot of ice cream, right? So yeah, that's a better that's a better analogy <laughs> right there. Uh, so so in the uh, data management part, you're really looking at this and asking those kinds of questions. Now that's extremely different kind of question from saying, uh, my competitor just changed my price. What do I do? Or uh, I have this. I'm going from a product based into a subscription based relationship. I'm going to launch this. How do I structure my subscription? Do I just do good, better, best? Do I just have one simple offer? How do I go into the market? Do I do the minimal viable product? Or how does this work out? What's the what's the engagement relationship? What's the path of journeying this customer from I first landed it to I'm expanding it? Or do I take a different approach? How do I think about that relationship? It's a very, it's a more strategic, expansive approach to pricing, then I'm looking at the past year's transactions to try to predict what the person should do next year. Mm-hmm. Right. Yeah, exactly. <clears throat> but you do need both, right? In, in any organization, I would argue that, you, you know, I mean, at least ones that are coming out with new products or services, you would need <coughs> both, excuse me. No, you do. Uh, so I was, uh, the reason why I wrote up uh, Wendy's talk is, one, I thought it was good. But the other one is I it went along also with what I heard from uh, John Kutcher, who used to work at Pfizer. He now works at GE Medical Areas. And he, defi- he, he ran his pricing team, and he divided it into the price setters and the price getters. Price setters are pricing the new piece of software that Pfizer was coming out. The price getters would help enable the sales team to capture the right price from the right customer. And so she expanded on that, and both of them actually came from Pricing Done Right, my text, my, my management book of trying to describe the different roles and functions and challenges of pricing. What they did and I did not do is they went in to start not describing the HR requirements, whereas mm-hmm. I was describing the organizational requirements. So it was yeah. a nice expansion on a topic. Yeah, it makes sense. So you touched on uh, economic value to customer a bit in in one of the comments you had made. Um, I thought maybe we should uh, drive into that a little bit. We've do, been doing a fair amount of work recently on uh, value estimation and, and large deal optimization and price effects. We've come out with a, a module we call Velo, which is kind of the amalgamation of those two concepts put into a word. Um, but the uh, the you know the idea of you know using these value based pricing principles to understand your unique and differentiated value and use that, especially in large deal um, negotiations, is one that I think has not really been covered a lot by pricing software companies in the past. There's a couple kind of boutique consulting companies that have come out with some software. Um, There are, but like in terms of the pricing optimization and management space, I believe we're the only ones that have actually kind of introduced this concept or or this this capability at this point. into it. And, and we think it's really valuable. Uh, I'd be interested to get your take on it and, so, and for you to talk about some of the experience that you have there and what you've seen in terms of the results that companies can get from, from these principles. So, but maybe maybe we should start off just also with a, an explanation of economic value to customer for folks that may not be you know, familiar with that concept. Yeah. Yeah. Economic value to customer. Show me the money. How much money am I putting on the table? That's what it's putting it down there. Yeah. Uh, GE subsystems uh, actually operationalized using economic value to customer in big deal system in big deals. And GE subsea systems, they're the ones that build the platform that you build the oil well on top of, and hopefully it doesn't break like the one in the Gulf of Mexico. And then you start to uh, drill there. 
it's a very expensive proposition and very customized work. So there's a few competitors to GE in the making a sub C system in stored system. Um, and so GE has to compete, and these are multi million dollar deals. Everyone, it makes sense to go through deal by deal and put together the economic value to customer. Um, so, wh what does this economic value to customer do? It, it really tries to ask from the customer's viewpoint why do I want this? Well, the customer is always asking for every purchase decision three basic questions. What's my alternative? What else is out there? Are you better or worse than that alternative? And do I care about that difference? Economic value to customer looks at the economic factors of that difference. I, I can't necessarily put a valuation on emotions, you know, uh, like I really just like the Corning brand. It's a great brand. No, it's going to not go up to the psychological part, but it will look at the economic part, which for B2B businesses is often very good, works even consumer as well. And it just tries to answer, why, if, if I built something and it's different than my competitor, does that make my customer better or worse? How much better in real money time? Right. And then put a dollar sign on it. After you do economic value to the customer, you can take some approaches that have been uh, discussed and documented to actually come up with a price that you should expect to land at, should walk away from, and set as a uh, stretch goal. Yeah. So, yeah. And, and part of what we do is, in addition to that, kind of the, providing the framework to establish that value, um, also the the kind of collaborative platform to manage the process around going after those outcomes in a cross-functional team, right? Because so having things like, okay, this is my, you know, my most desired outcome or my least acceptable outcome, or, or you know, here's my walk away, you know, going, here's what I'm going in at, here's what I'm walking away at, here, capturing the rounds of negotiation, agreeing as a team where you're at and, and how you're going to approach the negotiation because, I think procurement teams are getting increasingly sophisticated with regards to using um, strategy tools and tactics to, you know, get better results on the procurement side, right, and get better pricing um, or costing. You know, although it seems to, to me that some <clears throat> some of that has run its course a bit, and that um, that some procurement organizations are now understanding that it shouldn't just be about taking the price down. There are actually value drivers that are important, like let's say availability or on-time delivery, <laughs> those things are pretty important. If you're running a manufacturing line and you're, you're you know, relying on components coming into that or raw materials coming into that in order to be able to operate your production line at, you know, at a, a high utilization rate. So, um, you know, I, I, it's interesting to see that, that, how that's evolving. I think, you know, some of these ideas like, you know, the just-in-time inventory, you know, and taking all this like cost out of the supply chain, uh, was done in in a bit of a you know a fantasy land that there would be nothing that ever disrupted the supply chain, right? And it's like, well, now it has. So I did a, I did a survey, just a quick survey on LinkedIn for B two B buyers, uh, and I surveyed. I think I got about 37, 38 responses, something like. That. So it's not a huge end, but ninety three percent of them, I think, said that they'd be willing to pay more for supply chain continuity. Now, if you had asked that same question two years ago, I bet you it would have been you know, a, a bit lower, but, but still they would have, especially if they, they are in that, um, you know, that, that situation where they're dependent on certain components being delivered in a timely manner in order to run their business, uh, which, you know, who's not in, in some way, right? I mean, um, I mean in, in the software business, luckily we, we don't have a lot of that, but uh, I mean, to some extent, I mean, if if the computer chip shortage got to the point where the you know AWS couldn't provide us the the servers that we need to run our software, then that would impact us, right? So, it, it, to some extent, if you draw that that out well, far enough, everyone's dependent on something else in order to make their thing work, right? Um, so let's uh, let's talk a little bit about this concept of pricing as a verb, not a number. I like I like that idea that you would uh, have expressed in some previous conversations. 
And I mean, we we often describe pricing as a journey, right? And and uh, and we talk about the evolution of of pricing. Um, but but I like this idea that you know pricing's never never done, right? I think you're capturing this similar uh, sentiment in in that uh, that concept. But do you want to expand on that? What you mean by that when you say it? When it came to me, the the problem I saw too often was managers using pricing as nothing more than a number to close a deal. Not realizing there's decisions behind this. They're just trying to think, well, what number will it take to close this deal? Can I live with that number? Mm -hmm. And okay, you can close deals that way. But when you, you when you start to really profit, it's when you start to treat it more as a decision making process, uh, where you're thinking about how do I launch the price? How do I get it out there? How do I manage it over time? manage it with changes in inflation or changes in my competitor's motion. Um, and you start realizing it's a decision. It's not just simply a number. It's a management decision and it's very important. Um, so going back to uh, EVC and GE oil and gas subsea systems, it was Jesse Finch Nim who was talking to me about this. And part of his role wasn't just simply to tell the salespeople, the commercial department, Here's the number. His role is to tell them, here's your number. Here's why. Here's how you can communicate your value proposition to help close that deal. Right. And, and, and you're realizing that, yeah, I have a number or a price tag for a piece of paper. That doesn't mean you'll make it, you'll buy it. I need to help manage your decision to pay whatever number I put on this thing. So I'm acknowledging my decision. I'm acknowledging my customer's decision. And it takes an organization to pull this decision making off. Uh, too often, pricing in companies is left is officially in the hands of a data jockey, but is actually left totally up to whatever the salespeople want to do within the constraints of the finance department. And it's like that's not a decision making process that optimizes outcome. Somehow, that finance person and that salesperson need to work together. And maybe marketing as well, because they're the ones who are supposedly building the products and services for some purpose, hopefully to solve a customer need. But if they're doing this, then they need to work together at determining what that price is going to market. Otherwise, the salespeople says, yeah, that's just too high. I can't close that. And marketing person says, well, I just want market share. And the finance person says, well, where's my margin? And it's just like, that's not a decision. That's 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 an argument. It's just a clash of people yelling at each other. So treating pricing as a verb is talking about putting in the process, the people, the tools to drive pricing as a decision, not simply as the number needed to close the deal that passes mustard with finance. Absolutely. Yeah. I mean, I think that you know some of the things that you highlighted there are like that that framework the decision making process the collaboration that needs to happen and the mindset of those different actors that actually we're all working for the same company right and there should be agreement on what are the most important things across the organization and if there's not well, that's that's actually a leadership issue right it is that if, if you've got you know everyone of course has has some different goals but at the end of the day you know the the real key drivers for a company success shouldn't be that complex and it shouldn't actually cause conflict at the lower levels right the 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 leader and part of it is having a leadership uh you know the, um, structure that understands that and that and that you know doesn't create conflict within the organization easier said than done of course especially as companies grow and get larger and more complex everyone has their own kind of you know even even in our company we have we have 400 people and you know if you ask our CFO, what he wants versus our, you know, chief revenue officer, they're going to be at odds. Um, <clears throat> so you've got to acknowledge those things, but you also need to be able to balance between them and you need to be able to have constructive conversations on, okay, wh where's the, <coughs> excuse me, where, where's the, um, you know, the middle ground, where's the, where, where can we find the, the deal or the, the price or, or the process that, um, you know, really takes us in the right direction as an organization, right? And you can enable that with with tools, with process, and and also, but also with people that are that have that collaborative mindset. But uh, I think one of the challenges with the kind of new world that we're operating within now, more distributed workforces, is you can 
get even more of that kind of ivory tower syndrome in different organizations sometimes because you're not interacting with people as much, right, um, face to face. Um, so, you know, I, I, I gave this talk on the future of work at PPS a while back, and that was one of the things I talked about was we should really make like I, like people in pricing. I, I, may, I talk, talk to all this uh, my, my company as well. Right. I talk to them all the time about the people in marketing, the people in product should be with salespeople and, and attending our sales meetings and, and understanding how we do discovery and how we actually pitch things and where we're coming up against competition or objections and how do we handle those things. Those are the most important things. And really it comes down to that's because that's where the, that's where the action is, right? It's, it's because that's where you're interacting with the customer. Right. And, and uh, I, I had uh, David cancel on, he's a, a founder, many time founder of like five different startups, but lately drift that just, uh, they just got to be a unicorn. He was on the podcast last year and he was telling me about, just how important that customer centricity is in his mind as a leader to the point where he, um, and w when it really clicked for him, it was when he had been asking for this feature for a long time based on his interaction with customers. And he finally just connected the engineer that needed to do the thing with the customer directly. And like the next day or two, that feature was done. And he didn't even have to ask because that made it click in the engineer's mind like oh this is important it's not just david asking for it. it's not just the sales guy asking for it. it's the customer asking for it right and people can lose sight of that very easily if, if you don't if you don't allow them that that level of interaction and especially in a more hierarchical organization um you know it can be a real challenge so i think uh you know i, I think there should be as much of that kind of interaction between these different groups as possible and really being you know respecting like what what that person does and seeing what they do, you know, because a lot of pe people just don't realize like, oh, well, they think about like finance people or pricing people, I think a lot of times think salespeople are just, you know, oh, they just, they get all the credit, their job's super easy. They just go around playing golf and taking people to dinner and and close these big deals and make all this money, right? Eh, there's there's some truth to that, but there's a lot of hard work in 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 the background there in order to get to those those wins, right? And that's what people don't understand, you know, the relationship and the cadence and the follow ups and the diligence and the prospecting and all the stuff that goes into it until you've held a bag. You don't really realize it. Right. And and I, I mean, I was definitely in that in that boat when I was kind of, you know, in pricing and sales operations at Cisco. I, I didn't really know, you know, what the salespeople actually did. And not, you know, now that I've been in, in you know, sales and sales management roles, I actually understand that much better. But uh but I think we could all all learn from that, that kind of like that mindset and and trying to get, you know, as much kind of cross pollinization in these organizations as possible. You also talked about this idea of a pricing intelligence officer um, and kind of turning data into information uh, and that from an information mosaic to like hypothesis testing. And you touched on that a little bit, I think, in a couple of your previous comments. But I was just wondering if there if you wanted to expand on that, that idea. Um, yeah. Well, so going back to the idea of what Wendy Johnson was talking about, the different roles of pricing, it's almost impossible to find one person to fill all of those roles. That was her big point. And mm -hmm. other people made the same point at the late, most recent Professional Pricing Society's conference, virtual. But if you think about the, the person leading it or what is it you want out of the pricing team, there are different mindsets you want. One of them is to treat pricing as if it's like an intelligence officer. You know, the world of spycraft is fraught with problems and you don't actually know the facts, but you try to make a decision anyway. And if you wait too long, don't worry, you'll be dead because the enemy will come. And it, it's not quite that bad, but for a company, you have to make decisions on a timely basis or it'll go bankrupt and just go out of business um, or it'll be acquired, one or the other. And so the pricing department, one of the roles they have is to act as that intelligence officer of trying to determine what the best course of action to fulfill the corporate goals would be to make an intelligence assessment, right? Mm -hmm. Now, how do you make one? Well, you're going to have to collect a bunch of facts. And inevitably, when I run a research project for pricing a new product, I will come up with three facts about what the price should be, and none of them agree. You know? So now what do you do? 
Right? If you have one measurement, and these are real measurements that are perfectly well done, there's nothing wrong with them, but one measurement says 20, the other one says 80, management was expecting 40, and then you got to make a decision about what your recommendation is for the price and why. And that's not going to be easy. So you assemble the data into a picture of the whole issues. And you realize, okay, I got these measurements that were done perfectly fine. They just disagree because they're different methodologies. What other strategic factors should be influencing my recommendation about the way that I anticipate my competitors or the, the age of the product and the overall industry life cycle, product category life cycle? How do these things influence my decision about what price I put on that thing? When I think about a classic B2B pricing analytics based upon historic thing, now the best you can hope for, I saw Michelin do this, Michelin tires, is, is come up with what the expected price should be, what a nice stretch goal should be, and what your walkaway should be. But even if you do that, and you set it at like, say, the 90 percentile, you know that 10% of the time, the price is still out there beyond those ranges. So... You have to think carefully about, you, you know you're never going to be 100% correct. The goal is to be more correct than wrong and move the organization forward. Yeah, I agree. I think uh, one of the things I've talked a lot about is um, in, in talking, thinking about the future of commerce and the future of pricing, some of the things that digital native players do really well and that's one of them. Uh, that's, you know, Amazon has this idea of the 70% rule, which is basically to say, if you're 70% certain that that's the right answer, then try it out. And then, then having kind of an experimentation culture where it's okay to try and fail as long as you minimize the, the impact of a failure and you can assess it quickly and then pivot, right? And so, and that goes hand in hand with this idea of the, their first day principle as well, where you're always trying to think like a startup, think like the guys on the two guys in a laptop in a garage that are trying to disrupt your industry. Because if you don't think that way, someone will, right? And that's part of, you know, those those things are incredibly powerful when they're combined with machine intelligence. And, and uh, you know, I, I think uh, bigger companies can really learn a lot from that that mindset. Um, and it's it's one that's not prevalent in a lot of companies, but I think it's becoming more prevalent. Um, the, yeah. the mindset you're talking about has been documented in academic research. They call it effectual decision-making, mm -hmm. and it contrasts with predictive decision-making. So the research was looking at highly successful entrepreneurs, defined as people who built a business that did $200 million a year in revenue within five or 10 years, okay? So these are people who built something out of nothing. And they found that the effectual, that the entrepreneurs thought effectually meaning I'm willing to take risks as long as I can suffer the cost and move forward. Whereas the predictive one says all risks are bad. And if I'm going to take a risk, make sure that my expected ROI is positive. So one is looking to always gain the ROI. The other one is saying, let's take chances, but let's not take the organization. Very different approaches. Mm -hmm. And when it comes to pricing, the effectual decision makers basically said, let's choose the highest price and go on from there, and we'll drop it over time. Whereas the uh, predictive logic says, well, I need market share to move the not needle. Let's go for the middle and uh, make sure I drive it all out there. So yeah. very different decision making processes. Indeed. Indeed. Yeah. yeah. The problem is that once you get it in the middle, it's very hard to raise it up versus if you throw it out there at the top, it's easier to come down. But that's a whole other that's a whole other thing, but it goes back to the whole point of inflation. If you've been mispriced, now is the time to take advantage of inflation and raise those prices. There we go. Cool. Um, all right, Tim. Well, I, I think we're about done here. Um, I, I would like to wrap up by just saying, asking one, if there's anything else that you'd like to add, and two, sharing um, maybe uh, whatever you're, you've read lately that you found insightful that you'd like to share with the audience. Um, so I'll leave it, leave it to you to wrap up there. Well, I have been enjoying greatly seeing pricing actually discussed in the press uh, for the financial returns. Because usually when the quarterly reports come, nobody talks about price. 
So you have no idea what's going on. But now with inflation, everybody's talking about price. And you, it's almost interesting to see how the stock price moves in the weeks following an announcement about whether they're raising prices or not, or how afraid they are to raise prices or whatever. But yeah. meanwhile, UPS is doing well. That's I've been enjoying. Um, mostly what we've been talking about is my book called Pricing Done Right the entire time. The story of GE uh, Oil and Gas with Jesse Finch Nim, that's in there. Uh, there's a story about Piaggio selling Vespas in India. So how do you manage uh, cross-country prices? How do you manage uh, inflation as well? India is not the same as the Italy. <laughs> uh, how do you manage, how do you go about setting prices? What are the tools and the ways of thinking about price setting? And then moving right into price uh, management. After you've set the price, you now got deals. How do you manage that? Indeed. How do you get the price, right? How do you set and it? This is part, yeah, and this is part of why I've chosen a partner with PriceFX is that when it goes to price execution, yeah, you can do it manually, but why kind of a thing. When it goes to data management, you can do it manually once or twice, but then it doesn't make sense to repeat it forever. Right. And it's almost impossible for the organization to manage custom written Excel spreadsheets or Python to manage the organization to actually reliably produce good insights. And when it comes to updating price list, which has to be done, should be done once a year, although I've worked, I have consulted to several organizations that chose not to review their prices for three or four years. And I said, huh, I suspect there's an opportunity there. It was. <laughs> good thought. <laughs> uh, yeah, yeah. So it's like simple things, uh, yeah. but all of the stuff. It's one thing to hire smart people to get it done. It's another thing to also bring in the software to do it again and again and again. And that's why I thought this partnership was worth. Yeah, well, it's good. To your yeah. earlier point about pricing as a verb, right? It's not. It's it's not a, a a journey that stops, right? It's you continue forward. There's always new opportunities, new challenges, new market conditions that you need to be able to adjust to. So, I think we agree there. All right. Well, thanks a lot, Tim. It has been great uh, talking with you and great having you on. And uh, thanks everyone for listening to Pricing Matters.